Surviving or not? No? Struggling. Why not? It is a struggle. <laughs> to be a student is, by definition, is a struggle. It's because of Christmas. Oh, you have, uh, but you have deadlines for not many on Christmas. Which one is? Oh, CFD. Yeah. You are doing CFD or FEA? So you have the assignments for both. Really, you are doing both at the same time. Yeah, okay. It's parallel processing. <laughs> okay, very good. So I have some good news for you. We are finishing, right? So uh, I don't want to stretch you too much, too much. But there is a, a final topic we need to discuss a little bit, very briefly, let's say, which is the aeroelastic flutter, right? So last week. I think we did last week the divergence and aileron reversal, right? That was static aeroelasticity. This week we are going to work on the flutter with, which is a kind of more dynamic aeroelasticity or a kind of a vibration problem, right? Uh, so we will need to have our uh, Airfoil or a typical section if you want. So something like this. Let's see if I can draw it. Oops. If I can draw a nice airfoil. Maybe I can rotate a little bit more. Something like this. Yeah. So this is not bad. Now we, have, we are going to have uh, the location of the shear center this point here which i will call this point point p and then we have seen last week this this point or the reference point we we saw last week that it had a spring a torsional spring we can call this torsional stiffness as k theta so theta is associated with the angle, right, of the cross section. So k theta is the stiffness associated with the torsional uh, aeroelastic deformation, if you want, of, of the wing. We also used use this torsional stiffness last week. So we did the analysis for a one degree of freedom model, which was that distortional angle theta. But today we are going to include one more degree of freedom, which is basically the deflection of the wing. Or, you know, because of the lift, the wing will bend, right? And because of that bending, it will have a deflection or a plunge, right? Yeah? So because of that bending, there is going to be a stiffness associated with bending. And I'm going to represent that stiffness by KH, right? So basically, we will have, we will, we will have, as I was saying, we will have this angle theta. So this is one degree of freedom theta, and we will have another degree of freedom, which I will say is going to be this h, which is the plunge or the deflection of the wing. Okay, so this is going to be a two degree of freedom model that we are going to consider. So airfoil, the first point I introduced was the shear center or the reference point where we will have associated a torsional stiffness and a, a bending stiffness, both of these uh, sorry, the torsional stiffness is associated with the rotational degree of freedom theta, while the bending stiffness is going to be associated to the plunge degree of freedom h. We need to have two more points, which are this one here, or a quarter chord point, 
I'm going to call this point Q. Okay, so by the way, I didn't say last week, but I have been following this book, which I can write here, um, which you can get on the library. Introduction to Structural... No, <laughs> not that obvious. <laughs> Dynamics. So this first uh, end, Aerolisticity. Aerolisticity. Sticity. Is that just for this topic or all the topics? No, no, the, only for the aerolisticity. Yeah. yeah. So this first bit here, structural dynamics, is, are the first chapters of the book where they have. Um, I think you did that already. In, you did. You had vibrations, right? Last year with Chris Marler, you you did probably the you know a, a beam in bending, a vi vibrating in bending and torsion, these kind of things, right? You have done pr probably you have done something like that. So that is what he, he deals in the first uh, section of the book. Uh, on the second section, he focuses more on the airfoil, what we did last week, divergence and aileron reversal, and also on flutter. Okay. So the authors are Dewey, Dewey, H. Hodges <coughs> and G. Alvin, not Alvin Gatta, but Alvin Pierce. <laughs> All right. So these are the books I've been following. There are more in the library, different books for analysticity, uh, but I found this one easy to follow. It's my personal opinion, but you might have a different opinion anyway. Right, so this point here is the aerodynamic center where we are going to have our lift applied. Right, so we are going to have here our lift, L, applied on the aerodynamic center. And we are going to say that, yeah, and we are going to have also uh, this point C as well, which I'm going to include here, is point C, where, which is the center of gravity, where we are going to have the weight, the weight applied on this point C, all right? So what we need to have now is some dimensions to start our analysis. So we will measure, or the dimensions will be measured from the leading edge of the airfoil. So we will need this one here, the location of the shear center. So I'm going to define this B as being half chord or chord over two. So B is half chord, okay? So this dimension from the leading edge to, the, to point P is going to be given by one plus A times B times of the chord. So if this A is positive, you will have the location of the shear center going towards the trailing edge. If it is negative A, it's going towards the leading edge. Yes? Did you say that Q was the chord coordinator? Is that the same as the um, aerodynamic sensor? Or? Yes. Quarter chord, yeah. Quarter chord is the aerodynamic center, is Q, right? Where we have applied the lift. Because it is the aerodynamic center, I'm saying the pitching moment equal to zero. So that's why I'm not representing pitching moment there. Can the center not move with the course chord as geometrical, like, Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. So this, this distance, I don't know if I understand completely your question, but this distance from here to here is quarter chord, so it's going to be B over two. B is half chord, so if you divide B by two, this is going to be quarter chord. And you've also drawn your own dynamic center, so I just thought that that could vary, but the quarter chord length is fixed. Yeah, it can vary, yeah, but for this analysis, we are, we are, we are using yeah, B over two, yeah. Okay. Um, don't forget, the... the 
we are going to basically to spend one lecture with this, right? So the idea is to just show you what is the principles behind this, right? Not to do a very detailed, because we don't have time, and to do a very detailed aer 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 elastic flutter analysis can be really very complex. So this is just to give you some insight on how this, this works, okay? Right, so we need one more dimension, which is the location of the center of gravity. Uh, and for that, I'm going, let's see if I can do it here. Maybe I can increase a little bit. I need this distance. This is too big. Let's see. B over 2, this one. And this one from here to here, we're going to say it's going to be 1 plus E times B. Well, you don't need to worry too much with this A and B that I have there. So, for example, in the exam, I can give you just some dimensions for this, right? And ask you to get the... Uh, so, the, the thing is that this point, uh, uh, point C, center of gravity, and point P, shear center, in the design of a wing, they, they, they vary too much the location of this point. So, the idea of having this 1 plus A times B and 1 plus E times B is just to give some flexibility on the location of these two points, right? Yeah, yes? So this H the displacement? This H, yes, is the deflection, okay. yeah? Okay. Or the, also known as plunge. <coughs> Very good, so let me see, that's all we need, I think. Okay, we are also going to assume that uh, like we did last week, a small <coughs> rotation angle so that this, we can say that sine of theta approximately equal to theta and cosine of theta approximately equal to one, right? Small angles. Uh, the reason why small angles is uh, because we want to, to capture the beginning of the flutter, right? So the flutter happens not when you are taking off or landing. So it happens at high speeds, right? So at cruise. So, and at that point, the, these angles are small, uh, and also the air elastic angle we are considering to be very small because of the, we want to, to capture the flutter at the very beginning, right? Uh, right, so. Okay, so now, next thing we need to do is, what we need to do now is to get the equations of motion. Something you did in last year in uh, vibrations and dynamics, right? Get the equations of motion, and what I'm going to use for the equations of motion is the Lagrange equations. You are all familiar with that? More or less. So let's write here the Lagrange equations. So we have the derivative in order to time of the kinetic energy in order to the generic variable Q dot minus the derivative of the kinetic energy in order to the generic variable Q. Don't worry this, we are going to tell you what this is. Plus the derivative of the potential energy Let's call it P in order to generic variable. Q is equal to the generic force Q. So we better represent this QI, generic variable QI, and generic force QI, right? So this is the Lagrange equation. We can get the equations of motion from this equation quite easily. Yes? Yes. Should the other ones also have it? Or? No. no. So this one, this Q has a dot. These two terms, the Q doesn't have a dot. So, for example, if I say that, what are these generic variables? For example, if I look at my degree of freedom H, I will say that my generic variable in this case is going to be coincident with H. So my Lagrange equation becomes derivative in order to time of my kinetic energy in order to h dot, which is the, 
velocity of the plunge, right? Minus derivative of the kinetic energy in order to H, which is the plunge, plus derivative of the potential energy in order to the plunge degree of freedom. And this needs to be the generic force associated with the plunge degree of freedom, which in this case is going to be the lift. But I'm going to show you how you can get this generic force coordinate. All right? So, um, from this uh, generic equation, the Lagrange equation, we can get the equations of motion for any degree of freedom, h or theta. Uh, quite easy. The only thing we need to do is to calculate the kinetic energy, T, and the potential energy, P. Once we have that, we just do the derivatives and it should be all easy from that point. All right. So what I propose to do with you is to start getting the kinetic energy. So let me copy this guy. Don't want to draw it again. maybe make it a bit smaller. You can see it well, right? Yeah. All right, so. I'm going to calculate the kinetic energy T for this system. And that kinetic energy is going to be given by, there is a component of kinetic energy which is associated with the plunge, which is going to be one half of the mass times velocity square. And that velocity needs to be the velocity of the center of mass, so point Vc square. So this is the, the contribution from the the plunge to the kinetic energy, but we will also add the contribution from the rotation of the wing to the kinetic energy, and that contribution is 1 over 2. Now, instead of having a mass, we will have inertia, right? We will have the inertia moment, mass moment, about the center of mass. And this will multiply the angular velocity, which in this case is going to be theta dot angular velocity square, right? So this is the, if you want the translational contribution to the kinetic energy, this is the, this one here is the rotational contribution to the kinetic energy, right? Okay. Now, in order to have these terms, I need to define this velocity of point C. So, velocity of point C. There is going to be one contribution, which is associated with uh, uh, the plunge, which is h dot. You agree with me? And there is going to be a contribution. Look, point C, I can try to draw it here. So if I have my point P, which is the center, so point C, point C is here, is going to be describing a circular motion, right, about P. You agree with me? And the velocity of C in this circular motion is tangent. So this is Vc vector. <coughs> so we will have this point C rotating with the angular velocity, which is theta dot about P, right? You agree? Theta dot. So theta is the uh, twist angle. Theta dot is the rotational or angular velocity, right? Yeah, you agree with me? 
So this VC vector can be obtained from the external product of the angular velocity, which I can write like this, theta dot external product with the radius or with the vector PC, or if you want the norm of this vector V, which is going to be our VC, VC velocity is going to be equal to the radius uh, PC, which is 1 plus A times B minus 1 plus E times B, and all of this multiplied by uh, theta dot, right? We can simplify this a little bit more because these terms cancel. So VC is going to be equal. The so this is what I have here in red is the contribution only from the circular motion, right? Of course, we need to add then at the end with H dot. So this one cancels with this. So we will get B <coughs> A minus E theta dot, right? And this term I can, in fact, include it here. Uh, okay, so there is one more thing. Don't forget this VC. Uh, uh, this VC is going to. So that I can write here. Is going to be with this direction, the vector VC, right? So I need to project this in the H, di in the vertical direction. So I need to multiply by cosine of theta, right? So in order to project this vector in this vertical direction, this component, this angle is theta, you agree? But because I said that we are using Cosine of theta, small angles, we can consider cosine of theta equal to 1. So it means this term, let me delete this, otherwise it becomes very complex. So it means the vertical component of VC is going, needs to be opposite. So this signal here needs to be minus, and now B, A minus E, theta dot, right? Yeah. So that is VC. <coughs> okay. So What we need to do next is we need to now square this. So we need to get VC square, which is going to be equal to H dot square minus 2H dot B A minus E theta dot plus B square a minus e square theta dot square right and this is the term I need to use in my kinetic energy where so I'm going to replace now this VC square by this equation we obtained here and if I do that I get something like this so T kinetic energy is going to be 1 over 2 times the mass times h dot square minus 2 dot b a minus e theta dot plus b square a minus e square theta dot square plus 1 over 2 i c theta <coughs> dot square right
Okay? So I can I can group these terms the terms with h dot square and the terms with theta dot square and the other independent terms. So if I do that, I will get something like this, 1 over 2 m h dot square. And then I will have plus 1 over 2 m mass times b square a minus e square plus ic times theta dot square minus uh, m each dot theta dot b a minus e yeah so something like this now let's try to see what this term here inside means and for that I'm going to use the Kuening theorem you are familiar with that or not no all right so the Kuening theorem you had the dynamics, right, in year two, or not? Yeah, vibrations. vibrations. It was only vibrations, or? Yeah, only vibrations. Oh, okay. So I think it's better not to talk about Kuning theorem. I will complicate your, your brain. I don't want to do that. So this term here, inside this bracket, is equal to the moment of inertia, mass moment of inertia, about point O. Sorry, not point O, point P. So point P is this location of the shear center, right? So in this equation, we have used it here, the mass moment of inertia about the center of mass of the airfoil. And this term that you have here inside this curved bracket at the end is the mass moment of inertia about this point P. Okay? I could demonstrate that using the Kuning theorem, but because you didn't talk about that in year two, I don't want to talk about Kuning theorem then with you. So just assume this is, so just basically trust me on this, okay? Uh, all right, so, and then if we do this way, we can simplify then, we can simplify this uh, kinetic energy by saying is equal to one over two m h dot square plus 1 over 2 the sec the mass moment of inertia about point p times theta point square minus m h dot theta dot b a minus e all right and this is the equation we need to keep for the kinetic energy because we are going to we are going to have to make the derivative of the kinetic energy, as you can see here. So now that we have kinetic energy here, it will, it's going to be very easy to do the derivative of this uh, value, of this function here, okay? Now, <coughs> we also need to have the potential energy And the potential energy is not difficult, it's easier than the kinetic energy. So let me copy this figure again. Copy, put here in a new page. The potential energy, in fact, is easier. Why? Because it's given by one over two The stiffness of the spring here for the plunge degree of freedom times h square. So if you want the stiffness times h, this is a force. Yeah. 
If I multiply this by h again, which is a displacement or a deflection, force times a deflection basically gives me energy, right? Yeah? So this is the contribution for the potential. And that energy in that case is potential energy because of that uh, stiffness, plunge stiffness associated with the bending of, of the wing. But we also need to add the contribution from the rotational stiffness, k theta, times now theta square. Yeah, so same thing. If you want to think this way, k theta times theta, this is basically a moment. If you multiply that by theta, again, moment times a rotation gives you the energy as well at the end, right? So this is quite easy and we will need this as well for the Lagrange equations as you can see here and what we can do now is we can start using the Lagrange equation so for starting with the plunge degree of freedom this is the Lagrange equation we need to use so let me copy the kinetic energy. This equation here we obtained at the end. So let's copy and put there. Copy. Paste here, maybe a bit smaller. Okay, so I can maybe use the red color now to. Okay, so let's do first the derivative of the kinetic energy in order to h dot as you can see is only this derivative of this term so this is going to be m h dot right yeah quite easy isn't it see this is so easy <laughs> we need also what we need also the derivative of the kinetic energy in order to h so this term depends on h dot, this on theta dot, this on h dot and theta dot. So derivative in order to h is going to be equal to zero. Yeah? Now we need the derivative of the potential energy in order to h. So maybe I can now copy here the potential energy which we calculated from this equation. Copy, Let's paste it here. All right, so as you can see, if I do the derivative of the potential energy in order to H, I will get KH times H, right? Yeah? Okay, quite simple. In fact, in fact, there's one thing that is wrong on the derivative of kinetic energy, right? I forgot this term. You guys didn't tell me anything. That is a bit worrying. I forgot this term, so let's go, let's do this again. Not again, everything, but anyway. Uh, this term here, I need to redo this term. Right, so. Derivative of kinetic energy in order to h dot is going to be mh dot, that is fine. And I have now this term here as well, right? So minus m b oh it will not fit there let me move this guy here okay 
mb a minus e times <coughs> theta dot, right? This is correct now, right? All right. Now I can make it, I can move these guys a little bit to the right, and now I can move this because we need now to do the derivative of this term in order to time. So in order to do this, so I need to derive this in order to time, which is even easier. So that will be m h double dot, which is acceleration, minus m b a minus e theta double dot, which is angular acceleration, right? Okay. And we need to do the similar thing now for the uh, rotational degree of freedom. So I'm going going to copy this, copy, paste, but now instead of doing the plunge degree of freedom, we are going to work the theta degree of freedom rotation. So our generic variables so I'm going to do the, the right-hand side of Lagrange equation I'm going to do at the end, okay? Let's do the left-hand side first. Theta here, and of course, here you will have theta dot. Here is the derivative in order to theta, and here as well derivative in order to theta. And this is going to be the gen, 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 generalized force associated with the theta degree of freedom, which we are going to see what that is, right? So starting again with the uh, kinetic energy. Let's copy this kinetic energy again. Copy. Paste. So we will have to derive the kinetic energy in order to theta dot. That is going to be IP theta dot minus M B A minus E times H dot. Right? I think this time I'm not forgetting anything. I will need to derive the kinetic energy in order to theta. That is going to be equal to zero. We don't have any theta. We have only theta dot. And now for the potential energy, dp d theta, I will need to get the potential energy, which is here. Copy. Okay, potential energy is here. So this derivative of the potential energy in this case is going to be k theta times theta dot. Sorry, times theta. Yeah. Does it make sense? And now the last thing we have last thing we have to do is derive in order to time this derivative of kinetic energy in order to theta dot and that derivative is going to be ip theta double dot angular acceleration minus m b a minus e h double dot okay 
Now, we can go back to this <coughs> equation of motion for the H, or for the plunge degree of freedom. We can define this guy, KH, QH, sorry. QH, in this case, is going to be equal to the lift, <coughs> or in this case, The lift will have opposite direction of our plunge degree of freedom H. And don't forget, we are working the plunge degree of freedom H. So this generalized force is going to be minus the lift, minus L. And you know that the lift, you remember that from aerodynamics, the lift is going to be equal to the dynamic pressure times the area of the wing. Yeah? Times CL, the lift coefficient, right? And this CL, I'm going to co get this CL as the derivative of CL in order to theta times our angle theta. Remember from the CL curve, right? If you have the theta angle here, the CL coefficient. You get typically curves like this, right? For CL. So if I get the slope, so this term here is the slope, I call it CL theta. If I multiply CL theta by theta, which is this, I get this one, which is CL, right? So that's what I'm doing here, okay? Uh, you might be asking, uh, why, why, why don't we just put their CL? Because, don't forget, I want it to be dependent on theta, right? Our uh, angle theta. That's why I need to write it this way. Because when this theta changes, the lift is going to change as well. So we need to have a function for the lift as is, that is a function of theta. Yeah? That's the main reason. Good, good. So now for this degree of freedom theta in our Lagrange equation, the generalized <coughs> force Q theta uh, needs to be basically equal to the moment at point C. Don't forget that we calculated the kinetic energy using the velocity at point C, center of mass. So the moment needs also to be the moment at C, right? And uh, that moment at C will have two components. The moment at the aerodynamic center, which we are assuming equal to zero in this analysis. We did put the aerodynamic center at the quarter core distance. Uh, we are assuming equal to zero. Plus, because of the lift, where is it? Yeah. Uh, we can calculate the moment about point C produced by the lift as being equal to uh, this distance from C to Q, which is 1 plus EB minus B over 2. This is the distance times the lift that will give me the moment, so we can maybe simplify this a bit more. So we will have B over 2 plus B E times L, or if you want, we will have B 1 over 2 plus E times L, which is dynamic pressure, area CL theta times theta, right? So this is, I can copy this guy, copy, and this is going to be what I will have to include here, yeah, okay, so that is our 
generalized force associated with the theta degree of freedom in our Lagrange equation. Uh, and then we have everything. What I can and what I should do now is, so we have two equations, two <coughs> equations of motion for two degrees of freedom, h and theta. What I can do and what I will do is I'm going to organize these two equations of motion in something like this. The product of the, a matrix, a two by two matrix, which I'm going to define, which will multiply h double dot, the plunge acceleration, and theta double dot, the angular acceleration of the wing, plus another matrix here, another two by two, which we are going to fill quite easily from the, our previous equations. And this matrix is now going to multiply the plunge degree of freedom, h, and the rotational degree of freedom, theta. And this is going to be equal to zero. Okay? So we are going now just to fill these two matrices from this. So the first row, so basically we'll have here two equations for two unknowns, h and theta. We have here h double dot and theta double dot. We are going to see how we can transform that quite easily. But anyway, we'll have two equations and the first equation is associated with our h degree of freedom, the plunge. So I need, what I can do is, I can copy these equations because I don't want to be back and forward all the time. Oops. <coughs> so let me copy all of this. And then we can, let me put this equation here. I need to multiply it by theta. I could not copy. Now, look at this. I can quite easily. <clears throat> so this term here is going to be multiplying h double dot, right? Which term do I have multiplying h double dot? I have this one. So I'm going to put here m. What else do I have? Nothing else. This term here on this place in the matrix is going to be multiplying theta double dot. So what do I have here multiplying theta double dot? I have this term here, so I will have minus mb a minus e. Yeah, and that's it. This yeah, now, this term here is going to be multiplying h. What do I have here multiplying h? I have this guy. So, the stiffness for the plunge degree of freedom for that spring. And that's all, the only term I have multiplying h. While this term here is multiplying theta. What do I have here multiplying theta? Well, I have this term here, not the negative value, but the positive value, because don't forget this generalized forces, force in the Lagrange equation is on the right hand side. If I send it to the left hand side, it becomes positive, right? So what I will have there, here on the matrix is going to be QSCL, the derivative of the lift coefficient, right? Okay? And that's it for the first equation associated with the plunge degree of freedom. That's what I have. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to the rotational degree of freedom, which are these equations here. I'm going to copy these equations as well there and and now I'm going to include in this place is the term multiplying h double dot, which is
yeah, which is this one here, right? So I have minus M B A minus E. This term here is the multiplying theta double dot. So it's this one here, I P, mass moment of inertia about point P. This term in this matrix is the one multiplying H, which we don't have, so zero. And this term here is the one multiplying theta, which we have is here, which is k theta. Right? And after the break, we are going to work these equations here. And now the most interesting bit of the lecture comes after the break. So if you survive it, if you survive it this bit, you'll be nice after the break. Right? So let's do a five minutes break. Yeah? Then we continue. Analysis we have been doing. So we have this uh, system of equations here written in this matricial form. The problem here is that we have one matrix multiplying accelerations and other matrix multiplying what, the plunge and rotational degrees of freedom, so th which they are different. So we need to find a way to resolve this. And the best way to resolve this is there are different methods, but the one I want to introduce here with you is this one. So let's write, the, for example, the plunge degree of freedom, h, let's write it in this way. h bar, which is amplitude, times a term, this is the Nepper number, times pt. This term, e exponent pt, is, let's say, the frequency term, while this h bar is the amplitude term. So, you know, the wing is going to be vibrating, right? In vibration, we have amplitude of vibration and we have a frequency of the vibration, right? So that's what these two terms represent. So if you want, the units for this P are going to be S minus 1. It's the frequency units, okay? We can do the same for the rotational degree of freedom, theta. We can say there is going to be an amplitude contribution times this as well. And why are we doing this? Well, look, if you do the derivative, h dot is going to be h bar p ept. It's a quite easy, the derivatives in order to time. Right, same thing for the rotational degree of freedom. So you got the velocities if you do the derivative one time. If you do uh, the derivative another, if you do again the derivative, you get the acceleration h double dot h bar p square ept. For the angular acceleration, you get theta bar p square h e p t and you can see where this is going this is going so if I now replace these terms look I have here h and theta which I can replace with this h and theta. I have here h double dot and theta double dot, which I can replace with this h double dot, theta double dot. Yeah, so if I do that, I will have something like this.
So I will have, let me start with these two here. I will have here H Let me move this a little bit more and some space. So I will have here h dot theta, not dot bar, h bar, theta bar, and this will multiply EPT, EPT, and I will have to multiply this guy by P square. I will have to multiply this guy by p square. Same thing for this, p square here and times p square. Yeah? And this, <coughs> let me move this a little bit more to the left. Now, I also need to replace this h and theta. Let me delete all of this with h bar EPT, theta bar EPT equal to zero, right? Okay. You see what I did here? The advantage is now. This vector and this vector, they are exactly the same. Yes? Excuse me. Uh, the, the, the term, the fourth term in the sequence matrix, isn't it? Which one? I have a second term. This one? K theta. No, stiffness. stiffness. Here, K theta? Yeah. Yeah. What's the problem? <coughs> what, what's the question, sir? The, the one that comes from the moment. Oh, you're right. <laughs> I forgot that. This guy, right? Yeah. You're right. Thank you for that. It's time to finish this. What time is it? <laughs> All right, we can fix that. So you're very right, which is good. It means you guys are following this well. So here I need to, so let me, I need to find some more space then. So we will have k theta, k theta plus, let's see if I can paste this term here, plus this guy, oh it's so tiny. Very good. Minus there. So, yeah. So this is... Okay? Yeah, you're right. So let's just confirm. So we need to have this term. So this is when you send to the left-hand side, this becomes minus. And then this term is multiplying theta. That's why it was missing there. Yeah. Now it's correct, right? Yeah? <coughs> Good. Right, now, the good news is that now we have these two vectors, sorry, which are the same, these and these, right? So I can group this in a better way now. Uh, these two metrics can go together. So I will have MP square here, which is this term, plus kh. Then I will have these two terms. I will have qscl theta minus p square mba minus e. Now this term and this, so this becomes minus mb a minus e p square and this term here becomes this is big one so i p t 
times p square plus k theta minus b 1 over 2 plus e q s c l theta right and this matrix will multiply h bar ept theta bar ept right is it okay or not and this needs to be equal to zero right Sir? yes Yeah. Which, which one? In this one? Sorry. In this one? No, because this, what you had here, instead of this, you had H, instead of this, you had theta, right? And we defined H and theta. I define, for example, H as equal to H bar EPT. Yeah. All right. So this needs to be equal to zero. And we are going to focus on this. Uh, so maybe I can copy this final result we obtained. And put this one in a new page, shrink maybe a little bit, something like this. Yeah. Let me delete this. Okay. So this is a system that you are very familiar with. Uh, so you have basically here. Uh, homogeneous system of equations. Homogeneous because the right hand side is equal to zero. So you have here a system, two equations for two unknowns. The right hand side is equal to zero. And if you don't do something like this, so if we, if we don't do the determinant of this matrix If we don't do the determinant of this matrix equal to zero, if we don't impose that the determinant of this matrix is equal to zero, if you don't do this, you will have the trivial solution or h equal to zero, theta equal to zero, which does not serve our purposes, right? So you need to impose that this determinant is equal to zero and if you do that, this is a two by two matrix, right? So the determinant is this term times this minus this term times this, right? This cross product there. So if you do that cross product, you will have at the end an equation where you have a p power four, a coefficient, let's call it a four, another coefficient multiplying p square plus this equal to zero. So you will have this equation that will come from the determinant of that matrix. So these coefficients for A4, A2, A0, they will come automatically when you do this cross product, <coughs> right? Are the coefficients af affecting P power four and P power two and the independent term. So you will have this equation for the solutions P, and because this is a, 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 a polynomial with degree 4, you will have 4 roots or 4 solutions for P. Uh, how can we obtain these 4 solutions? We can do something like this. We can say, for example, that we are going to define a new variable, Y equal to P squared. If I replace in this equation, I will get a4 times y squared plus a2 times y plus a0 equal to 0. Quite easy. And now this equation is very easy to get these two solutions, right? I can say y is going to be equal to uh, 
uh, minus a2 over 2a4 plus minus square root, oops, 2a4 here and square root here of a2 square minus 4 times a4 a0. Yep. Is this correct or not? <clears throat> and if you keep in mind that this y is equal to p square, we can then get the solutions for p by saying something like this. So p is going to be equal to plus minus square root of everything that is there, which I can. <coughs> right? This is going to be the solution for my P. Look at this. Inside this outer square root, you will have two, two solutions. Inside this outer square root, you have the positive and the negative solution, right? And because the outer square root, you also have the positive and negative solution, so you'll have at the end four solutions, which makes sense because you, the solutions are for this polynomial, are the four roots, so you need to have four solutions. Another important thing is you have square roots there, and you have these coefficients, a0, a2, and a4. You can have, basically, inside these square roots, you can have a positive number or a negative number yeah and because of that situation of having a positive and a negative number i can write these solutions p in this form sigma j plus i times w j this i is as you know square root of minus one is the imaginary number from complex numbers right this is because you can have negative square roots there. <coughs> so we can end up having this situation. <coughs> Sorry. So this <coughs> sigma j is known as the damping coefficient, damping term and this wj is known as the frequency okay and look what i'm going to do now i'm going to write here again the equations we defined for the plunge degree of freedom h bar ept and for the rotational degree of freedom. We remember we start from these equations, right? And now I'm going to replace my P solutions with, so I'm going now to replace my, for example, looking at the plunge degree of freedom, I'm going to replace my P with these solutions, a damping real part in the complex number plus the imaginary part which is associated with the frequency. Okay, and I can do the same for the rotational degree of freedom. It's going to have a contribution from damping and a contribution from the frequency. And look what I'm going to do now. I'm going to continue here. I can do something like this. For example, for the plunge degree of freedom, I can, this x Nepper number with this exponent, I can convert it something like this, a term which will have the damping, the damping contribution, and this is going to be multiplying a term that will have the frequency contribution. Okay, let's look at the planche. It's the same thing for the, for the torsional degree of freedom. And one thing I want 
before we proceed, I want you guys to this term here, the Necker number raised to this imaginary number. This is known as the Euler formula. Yeah. Which basically tells us something like this. This is equal to cosine of WJT plus I sine of WJT. So this formula, uh, uh, Euler formula, basically you will have here a component which is a real number and this other component is an imaginary number. But anyway, this is an harmonic which will give you something like, if you try to plot this Euler, it will give you a <coughs> harmonic behavior like this, right? Right, so going back to this equation here, you will have this contribution here from this term, which will give you an harmonic like this. And you will have a contribution from this term here, maybe I can put it in a blue box, which is a term associated with damping. And depending on the value of this sigma j, and I want now here to make a, so if we focus, oops, if we focus on this term now, e sigma j t, right, this one that you have there, there are two options for this sigma, for this damping, it can be positive or negative. If this is positive, what you are going to have is, if you try to plot this E sigma j t here and here the time, if the sigma j, if the damping is positive, what you are going to have is a function that is going to be growing exponentially with time, yeah? And Look at this. What is the problem with this? The problem with this is that if you are multiplying... Now, look again to this equation. You are going to be multiplying an harmonic, this one, with a function that is growing exponentially with time. So what you are going to do is you are going to be starting... So if I put the, an envelope for the exponential function due to damping, you are going to have an harmonic that is going to be growing inside this envelope and it will go to infinity sometime, right? Yeah? <coughs> On the contrary, if your damping coefficient is negative, lower than zero, you are going to have a function that is going to be decaying with exponentially with time. So it means you are going to have a function. So this drawing is now getting very confused, confusing. So let me try to move this guy away, put it here, and make a new one here. You are going to have basically an envelope here. Oops. And then you will have an harmonic that will start with some value but is going to be decaying with time and go to zero eventually, right? Yeah? You see the importance of this? So, we did this analysis for the plunge degree of freedom, but same thing, exactly the same thing happens for the torsional or theta degree of freedom. So, depending on these solutions that you obtain from this determinant, you get from the determinant, you get this equation, which will have four solutions. That four solutions for P can be organized in this way, a real component, which is the damping, and an imaginary component, which is the frequency. If you replace these solutions in our initial equations for the plunge and the, the torsional degree of freedom, you will get at the end 
two important components on those solutions. These two is associated with damping. This one associated with the harmonic. And depending on the value of the damping, you can have an oscillation that is growing in time for positive values of damping or that is decaying with time for negative values of damping. And this is quite important because this solution, uh, if you look carefully here, these coefficients A4, A2, A0, that will, are going to be very important for the solutions of P that you are going to obtain, they depend a lot on many things on the wing. Look at this. They depend on the bending stiffness, stiffness for bending. They depend on the torsional stiffness, something we calculated some weeks ago, right? When we did the torsion. They depend on the location of center of gravity, location of the aerodynamic center. So when you design a, a wing for uh, the flutter, you need to make sure that uh, you don't get, for example, positive damping. You don't want your oscillation to be growing indefinitely, right? So we can then, and to finalize in some way this lecture, I can introduce you the two most important plottings you can have for flutter. And they are somehow related with this analysis we, I did here in this slide, OK? <coughs> you will have one plot. I can draw it here, where you will have here the free stream velocity of the aircraft. And here you will have the uh, frequency. And you will have here another plot where you will have, again, the free stream velocity and you will have the damping. And typically, this plot here, you, have, you will have a, something like this. So this is for one frequency, for second frequency. They will merge at this point. This point is PA. You are going, we are going to, to, to see what is going to happen. So basically what happens is, look, in this equation we obtained here, you can see you have here dynamic pressure, right? Q, right? Dynamic pressure depends on the velocity of the aircraft, right? So for each velocity, in these plots, for each velocity, you can calculate that determinant, get the solutions for P, get the frequency, get the damping, and you can plot this graphs and they are typically something like this for the frequency and something like this for the damping. This is VA. Okay? And this VA is the limiting velocity you can have because look, for velocities that are be below VA you get negative values for damping. And I told you, negative values for damping means you have this curve here in green, yeah? You have this exponential of a negative number means a function that is going to zero. And that means you are basically attenuating the oscillation of the wing, right? Once you reach VA, this point VA, limiting point, what is going to happen is your frequencies, they are going to be merged together, so W1 will become equal to W2. But the problem here is you can have a solution for the damping that will start to be positive. That is the problem. And then that's when the flutter happens, happens right? Because you will have a positive damping, it means your oscillation is going to start increasing, and then flutter will happen. So. This is a design limit point for the velocity of the aircraft. So of course, we want to get this VA as high as possible. Yeah? 
and in order to do that you need we need to basically play with this all these coefficients we have for the link stiffnesses of the bending stiffness torsional stiffness and also located of these critical points like aerodynamic center shear center all of that yeah that's what we do on on footer is to make sure we get the highest VA as possible to avoid a positive damping value right there are much more much more on flutter uh, but what I would like you to to keep uh, in mind is uh, how we obtain so all this analysis until we reach this point is something you also did last year in vibrations for sure right uh, this way of getting these solutions is is not difficult basically we are solving a a second order equation polynomial getting two roots using this well known formula uh, and then at the end because we defined y equal to p square we are able to get four solutions for p from this equation which because of square roots we might have positive negative values depending on the coefficients we can organize the solution in this form where the real part is the damping imaginary part is the frequency and then this analysis just can yes. If you go back, uh, yeah. You know, it shouldn't be uh, sigma plus or minus. Yeah, yeah. You will have two solutions for this, right? That's why here you have these two curves. One for sigma one, one for sigma two. Two solutions, right? So, yeah. W look, you will have. You can for p. You can have a p one which is going to be for them sigma 1 plus IW1. You can have a P2, which can be, for example, sigma 1 plus IW2. You can have a P3, sigma 2 plus IW1. And you can have a P4. So you can see the combination, right? Yeah. yeah? So in these plots, you also can see that you will have two solutions for 1W1, 1W2, and two solutions for the damping as well. Sigma 1, sigma 2, right? At this point, they converge into 1, but this is the real problem. We don't want damping to go positive. Um, that's, that's the main thing, right? So, is it a good thing on the left graph when the frequency goes down? Uh, yes, it's a good thing, but the problem is this guy, don't forget, you will have, if you look at this equation, even if this term goes down, if the frequency goes down, if, the, if this term is small, this guy grows exponentially. And it can be infinity, right? So that, can, yeah, that is a problem. Yeah? Okay? You look a bit dead. <laughs> so, yeah, we will finish. I don't have more, nothing more to say on Flutter. So that's all I want you to know. So, if, for example, in your exam, I might give you something like airfoil with some dimensions. Yeah? ask you to to get this use Lagrange equations and get this eventually right yeah so anyway I will upload the exams from the past years in blackboard but next week I'm going to do revision so I'm going coming here and talk about key points everything we discussed it. all right yeah for for this or for I, I can discuss that next week. Yeah, we can discuss that. What I recommend for you guys to do. Uh, yeah?